Hey everyone, welcome to Neuropod, a channel about all things related to the Elon Musk founded company Neuralink. This update episode includes many recent comments from Elon about the future of Neuralink. We'll start with a clip from a Lex Friedman interview with Elon, then a casual conversation with Elon Musk and Bill Riley from SpaceX and Dan Carlin of the Hardcore History Podcast. Next, a roundtable discussion with Elon Musk and the goofballs at the Babylon Bee. Then, some notes on creating neural shunts if you have Neuralink microcontrollers implanted in your limbs. We'll follow it up with a tweet where Elon said he changed his mind about brain transplants. Then, Elon won two awards for being Person of the Year. We'll discuss his engineering impact. And then, we'll round it out with a few simple Neuralink data points we continue to track at Neuropod. During the Lex Friedman interview, Elon and Lex discuss the neural networks being used to drive Tesla's autopilot functionality. They compare the camera sensors on the Tesla vehicles to our own human eyes, and then move on to discussion on how our brain works. I find these clips particularly interesting because of the potential for our Neuralink implanted brain to connect with various sensors, such as full light spectrum visual sensors and advanced prosthetics. The brain is doing a crazy amount of post-processing on the vision signals from your eyes. Um, it's insane. So, um, and, then, and then even once you get all those vision signals, uh, your, your, your brain is constantly trying to, for, to, to forget as much as possible. So human memory is, perhaps the weakest thing about the brain is memory. So because memory is so expensive to a brain and so limited, your brain is trying to forget as much as possible and distill the things that you see into uh, the smallest t smallest amounts of information possible. So your brain is trying to not just get to a vector space, but get to a vector space that is the smallest possible vector space of only relevant objects. Later in the conversation, they continue with discussion of the Tesla bot. While listening, I urge you to consider what a fully functional Tesla bot would be able to do if it were connected remotely to someone's brain. The possibilities are, you know, endless. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's obviously like a, it's not quite in, in Tesla's primary mission direction of accelerating sustainable energy, but uh, it is a an extremely useful thing that we can do for the world, which is to make a useful humanoid robot um, that is capable of interacting the, with the world and um, helping in, in many different ways. Taking my earlier thought a step further, I'd be surprised if Elon hasn't already considered the possibility of Neuralink developing an artificial brain to pair alongside Teslabot. With enough knowledge and data of how brains work, I don't see what would stop something like this from being built in the very long term. Elon did another interview, this time with Dan Carlin from the Hardcore History Podcast. This pretty casual conversation was quite different from many other Elon interviews. Despite having tremendous respect and knowledge of Elon's public statements, I was surprised to learn of the breadth and depth of Elon's recall of historic events. The conversation centered around Elon's primary message, which is that engineering is underrated in its impact on the outcome of wars. However, the part most related to Neuralink, in my view, is the discussion of what the future of war might look like. Listen to this clip and consider what might happen if you have countries developing Tesla bot-like armies that are fighting on the ground, or Tesla drone-like bots in the air and sea. Yeah, so, so this is an interesting thing that happened. Like, you know, so when, when we, honestly, once we developed nukes, like wars between superpowers became a decision to destroy humanity or not, or to destroy civilization. You'd get some pushback on that from some military leaders, you would. No, but I mean, it's, it's just like the stakes are very high. Like you can't just go around using nukes uh, without getting, getting nuked yourself, basically. So, 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 like in wars between superpowers, like serious wars, were not going to happen because the, it, it would just be mutually assured destruction. Uh, at least there was a very there was a, too much risk of of such a thing to uh, have a superpower war. However, drones now move that completely in the other direction. Now you can have a drone war where very few people die, or maybe no one dies in, in a drone war, and whoever's drones are successful, they they won the battle. And, and this may actually reduce the, the risk of, of a war. Or, or, sorry, reduce, reduce the risk of, reduce the penalty of a war and increase the risk of having a war. Because it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it ends up being battle bots, you know, and, and so 
that could be one of the things that happens is that it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's now, it's now, now the stakes have gone super high with nukes to actually n- not even having human casualties. I dream of the day wars are simply not fought, but would be perfectly content with wars that have no casualties. If things play out this way, the war winners would primarily be determined by which country or countries have the best engineers. So it looks like we've come full circle on Elon's message. Engineering has historically been underrated in its impact on the outcome of wars. In this clip, the CEO of Babylon B asked Elon what his thoughts are on the metaverse. What are your thoughts on the metaverse, which like takes technology to the next level and puts us in like a virtual world? Like, do you see that as being dangerous, hopeful for humanity? Like, what's your view on that? Maybe we're in the metaverse right now. <laughs> it's just metaverses all the way down. <laughs> um, I don't know if I necessarily buy into this metaverse stuff. Um, although people talk to me a lot about it. It's Web3, you know. Like, sure, you, you can put a TV on, on your nose. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure that makes you in the metaverse, you know. Um, and it's like weird, like, you know, when I grew up, it was like, don't sit too close to the TV, it's gonna ruin your eyesight. Right. And now I got like TV is like literally right here. <laughs> I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> is that good for you? <laughs> I recently tested the Oculus Quest 2. Omar and I even held a meeting in Meta's Horizon workrooms. I personally felt the experience was moderately fun, solely because of the novelty factor. However, after playing around with it for several minutes, I began to feel more annoyed by the bright screen immediately in front of my eyes. Additionally, I experienced the motion sickness that Elon goes on to describe here. I mean, have you tried these games, uh, you know, the the VR, Oculus stuff? Yeah, Yeah, they're okay, you know, Mm -hmm. but like it gives you motion sickness if you try to walk around. Like like you can do a video game on your sort of computer console or whatever, and and, and you can you can be in a, like a first person game and and uh, and move rapidly and not get set motion sickness but if you try to do that in a beat with vr goggles you get motion sickness it's like weird so then you have to like teleport around with yeah, it's okay <clears throat> so it doesn't it doesn't feel like like that's the answer necessarily do uh, you have a near link the into the brain so that you don't have to have the glasses there you go yeah a neural link long term a sophisticated neural link could um, put you fully, fully in a virtual reality thing. You know, I think we're far from disappearing into the metaverse. Uh, this sounds just kind of buzzwordy and, you know, I, I don't know if you're like, hey, like, like, hey, is this, you know, have I just gotten too old and like, am I like one of those people who was like dismissing the internet, whatever, 95 as being like some fad or something that's never gonna amount to anything? Although I didn't, I was like, Saying like 95 was literally the internet is going to be transform humanity and, and it's going to be like, you know, prior information basically just went by osmosis. Like unless a person called another person or carried a letter physically to another person, like how did you get information around? The vast majority of information was literally person to person. Then you had like the fax machine and stuff, but it's just like... The, the way the metaverse is being sold right now is so underwhelming. It's like you're going to be in, it's like Zoom meetings, but there's an avatar <laughs> for, for the person next to you, you know? And you maybe, you get to de- maybe you get to design your avatar. Life. Like I said, I don't, I don't want to be like, you know, some old, some old codger sort of dismissing the internet in 95 is not amounting to anything. So there's some danger with that. That's the case. But uh, I, I currently am unable to see a compelling metaverse situation um, or... Web3 sounds like more marketing than reality. I don't get it, you know, and maybe I will, so, uh, but I don't get it yet, let me put it that way. Neuralink is developing a surgically implanted brain machine interface. I have a tough time thinking any non-invasive wearable brain machine interface is going to even try competing with Neuralink in the VR space in any meaningful way. After half an hour of discussing Elon's other ventures, they eventually come back to discussing Neuralink. So like how fast can you, can you, can you communicate with your, your phone using uh, two thumbs? You know, 10 bits per second, it's, it's very low, the data rate. And if, if computers can, and which they can, communicate at a, a, you know, a, billion, a billion bits per second or more, and, and we're communicating with them at 10 bits per second, then uh, that's just an extremely slow 
communication link. Elon then went on to add that he thinks Neuralink achieved a new world record. And we, we, we recently got uh, what we think is a world record in bits per second from, uh, from any uh, neural, neural device. Like we're, start, we're starting to approach 10 bits per second, which is not actually, well, not, not that big, but it's more than anyone else has achieved in, in a useful way. Ten, ten, like close to 10 useful bits per second is where, where we are. And it will, will increase that dramatically over time. Um, he then goes on to discuss the importance of safety. Like Tesla goes beyond the regulatory standards for safety of vehicles, Neuralink's standards also exceed the regulatory standards for safety. He then continued discussion of dual Neuralink implants. Um, and I'm increasingly confident that um, uh, we, we can implant a second Neuralink device, so one, one that accesses the, the motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex, and then a, a, a second one that is uh, past where the injury is. Uh, so if you've got a separate, you know, but basically where, where are the neurons still functional? Um, and implant a second a neural link device uh, and uh, act, ha have the two devices talk to each other and just transfer the signals across the where, where, where it broke. Yeah, because yeah. it's like a broken circuit. Right. You know? So if you've got a broken right. circuit, you just you, you basically just do a signal transfer between the two. And you don't necessarily even need to, to know what all those signals are. Um, you just need to transfer the signals. Um, so just like if you have like a, an Ethernet cable, you don't need to know what's on the Ethernet cable for the cable to work, or, or a wireless Ethernet, from one wireless Ethernet, you know, Wi-Fi box to another wireless Ethernet Wi-Fi box. You don't need, need to know what the contents of the signal are in order to transfer the signal. Um, so I, I'm confident that that such thing is possible. Um, I'm not saying we will do it. Um, I don't want to set unreasonable expectations, but I'm I would say I'm certain that it is possible. Um, and we will try to make it happen, which would uh, then enable people to walk again and use their hands and I think long term probably restore full body functionality to somebody who um, has none. This idea of implanting two Neuralink implants is nothing new for ardent Neuropod listeners. He continued on Twitter saying, quote, later versions will be able to shunt signals from Neuralinks in the brain to Neuralinks in body motor sensory neuron clusters, thus enabling, for example, paraplegics to walk again." Unquote. The most recent blog post on the Neuralink company page includes this note. It says, prior research by the BrainGate Consortium have shown that neurons in the motor cortex remain directionally tuned to the movement intention even in people with paralysis. Unquote. Within the past few decades, it's become known that people who are paralyzed can almost always process in their brain the movements that they want to do. The thing that prevents the person from being able to execute on those thoughts is that the connection between the brain and the limbs is broken. Specifically, the signal being sent from the brain never reaches the place it needs to go. But since it's new to some folks, let's refer back to a tweet from Elon in July of 2020. In a Twitter conversation, Elon was asked about Neuralink's aspirations related to the spinal cord. He responded, quote, Yes, should be possible to create a neural shunt from motor cortex to microcontrollers in muscle groups and restore movement even if someone has a fully severed spinal cord. First part has already been demonstrated with the Utah array, but not as an outpatient device." Unquote. This idea of a neural shunt is the wireless re-establishment of a broken connection. It's also likely one of the reasons Neuralink decided to highlight dual implantation during their summer update in 2020. So we said, well, what if we do two Neuralink implants um, and we've been able to uh, do uh, dual neural link implants uh, in, th um, actually, I think three pigs at this point, and we have a couple of them here. Um, and we've been able to show that you can actually have multiple neural links implanted, um, and again, healthy and happy and indistinguishable from a normal pig. So, um, so it's possible to have multiple links in your, in your head and have them all be sending out signals, and you're working well. Similarly, they showcased dual implantation in the brain of this macaque monkey last year. This is Pager. He's a nine-year-old macaque who had a Neuralink placed in each side of his brain about six weeks ago. If you look carefully, you can see that the fur on his head hasn't quite fully grown back yet. He's learnt to interact with a computer for a tasty banana smoothie delivered through a straw. 
We can interact with the Neuralinks simply by pairing them to an iPhone, just as you might pair your phone to a Bluetooth speaker. I should point out this neural shunt concept is different from having two Neuralink brain machine interface implants in the brain. Specifically, the neural shunt concept would probably include implantation of a different Neuralink product, maybe just microcontrollers or maybe some sort of advanced prosthetic. Regardless, there are exciting times ahead for eventual product unveilings from the Neuralink team. Next, Elon responded to a question posed by Tim Urban of Wait But Why, who by the way has a very lengthy article summarizing Neuralink, which I highly recommend. The question was, what's something you've changed your mind about? And although it's a play on words, I predict Elon's being serious as he speaks very literally. He's changed his mind about brain transplants. It's unclear if he's now in favor or now not in favor of brain transplants, but this adds to the speculation that Neuralink could one day be able to actually make the decision of performing brain transplants, brain replication, or artificial brain development. Time will tell. Person of the year. More like person of the millennium. Call me fanboy or whatever, but I respect him for the good he's directly influenced and indirectly inspired. Elon Musk finally got a little more recognition this year as he won Time Magazine's Person of the Year and also Financial Times Person of the Year. I wanted to highlight comments from Elon on what he attributes some of the success of Tesla and SpaceX to. I believe this advantage will also come to light at Neuralink over the coming years. Here's part of the article from the Financial Times. Musk's own explanation for Tesla's success turns on his passion for engineering. The thing that people who don't work with me don't understand is that I'm first and foremost an engineer. He says, how have Tesla and SpaceX succeeded when other companies have far more resources and money than I do? The problem is they can't hire me. He also says that dedication to engineering excellence and a focus on important challenges has been critical to attracting top engineering talent. The article follows up with, when you go after the hardest problem in the world, the best people in the world want to come and work for you, says Gene Berdachevsky, a former Tesla battery executive. For a full decade, Tesla was the only game in town. I cannot reiterate this talent advantage enough. At Tesla, it was super clear the team I was working with was top notch. Unfortunately, the top engineering graduates at universities around the world are simply not busting their butts to work at General Motors. Likewise, once the field matures, if someone wants to work in the brain machine interface space, is going to be quite the challenge for companies to compete for talent in related fields. We've been keeping track of Neuralink's employee count and LinkedIn plus Twitter followers. As you might expect, the trends are up and to the right. Neuralink is continuing to look for talented people who are motivated by the mission of the company to solve important brain and spine problems. They're looking to hire in almost any department. Apply at Neuralink.com if you're interested. If you missed our December update episode on Neuralink, check it out here. And if you enjoy these Neuralink updates, please consider subscribing. My name is Ryan Tanaka. Thank you for watching.